Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Andreevich. I'm in the School of Media, Film, and Journalism at Monash University, and also a chief investigator in the ARC Center for Automated Decision Making in Society, which is uh, sponsoring this event. And um, I would like to, uh, to start our evening off. I'm, I'd like to welcome you all here and to thank you for coming uh, by inviting Janet Galpin of the Boonwurrung Land and Sea Council to uh, do a welcome to country for us. Um, and, ah, where is Janet? <laughs> she might be out, out back. Um, I'll, I, I'll, I'll frame this by saying that this uh, panel is part of a two and a half day hackathon that we're running through the center that's taking a look at uh, targeted advertising in online platforms and the forms of accountability that we uh, might want to have in place in order to address uh, possible concerns and issues. Um, and uh, we've got two great panels that are going to talk to us about the types of issues that we're facing and also some possible solutions and strategies for addressing online advertising. And now I'll turn it over to uh, Janet Gilpin. Galpin. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Wamindjika. Wamindjika is the Bunwarang language word for come with purpose. And if we think about those words to come with purpose, everything we do from waking in the morning to sleeping in the evening is done with purpose. So Wamindjika, Miram, Big Big, Bunwarang, Nairmderp, Barupton, Atawilam. Come with purpose to our beautiful home land of the two bays. I'm privileged to be with you here again today after having done the welcome for the official launch of the ARC Centre for Excellence back in about, I think it was December 21. Uh, so thank you for having me back again. So your purpose this evening is to be here for the Dark Ads Hackathon. And your panels later this evening brings together some of our greatest minds in Australia to address and discuss the impact of dark ads and what can be done to keep online ads accountable. This is becoming a real problem, not just here in Australia, but all around the world. And you're the very people to take the rein on this matter. And my purpose tonight is to deliver a welcome to country. So we have the pleasure of welcoming you from whichever country you are from. I am a direct descendant from our First Peoples and cousin to Nawit Dr. Carolyn Briggs AM, the elder of the Bunwarung and the Yalakut Wilm. I'm here today representing Dr. Briggs and I'm also obviously of Irish and English descent. We are the custodians of our lands that extend from the Wilson's Promontory in the east to the mouth of the Werribee River in the west, encompassing both of our beautiful bays, Western Port, we call Murren, and Port Phillip, we call Nam. It's not only my great pleasure to welcome you all here today, but it is my responsibility to ensure that you come with purpose. So woman Jika, come with purpose. I do so not only on behalf of my ancestors, but I also do on behalf of all of our First Nations peoples on whose lands we meet today. First Nations people across Australia all share a special connection to the lands and to the waters of their ancestors and that has not been disconnected from the millennia despite dispossession, displacement and discrimination that we have experienced over the last 200 plus years. These connections date back to our creation stories. For the Bunwarang, our creation story tells us about Bunjil, our creative spirit who travels as an eagle and how he created the lands and the waters around where we meet today. He also created the Kulin people and he taught them about their circular relationship that they have with these lands and waters. In order for us to be taken care of by the land, we also had to take care of the land. And we did this by adhering to our Warangi Bik, our laws of the land, our customary laws. 
Much like our laws today, these laws dictated how we interacted with each other and how we interacted with the land and how we also conducted ourselves while we were on other people's country. The Bunwarang Waramibik speaks of three specific laws and the first is Yulenj. It's the responsibility that we have for knowledge and once knowledge is attained, we then have a responsibility to ensure its survival, its continuation. We have a responsibility to younger generations to maintain that knowledge and to pass it down so it can be used by future generations. We also have the law of Jimbana. This law speaks of community and the importance of community, but the importance of a diverse community and a unified community. The Bunwarang people and the Kulin nations understood the power of diversity, that it widened our lands and increased our capabilities. And it's always good to share stories and different experiences. However, they understood that to utilise this very powerful tool, they had to identify a common purpose, hence Waminjika. Finally, the last law is our connection to country, or we might call it honouring sacred ground, paying respect to past generations, the people who took care of the land before us, and the people who have lived and died on the land before we were here, paying respect to the stories and the histories of the lands of where we live today. We are very fortunate in Australia to have 80,000 plus years of human history, and it is most important always to re pay respect to that history. So if we can adhere to these three Warani Bik, I can say in the words of the ancestors once again, Waminjika, Miram Bik Bik, Bunwaran, Nam Derp, Burupton, Whelan. Come with purpose to our beautiful home, land of the two bays. Non Gudjan, thank you. Thank you so much, Andy Janet. Um, I, I would like now just uh, to introduce Julian Thomas, who's the director of the ARC Center of Excellence for Automated Decision Making in Society uh, and a professor at RMIT University. Um, it, it's wonderful to have Julian here and he'll s t talk a little bit about uh, the center, the center's role. Uh, obviously, the hackathon fits uh, with a series of issues that are raised by automated decision-making systems, which is the focus of the center, precisely because of the systems that are used to process the information that's collected about users and to distribute the advertising that uh, we're going to be taking a look at over the course of the hackathon. Julian, thank you so much for... Uh, kicking us off. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, and it's really exciting to hear about the work that you've already started doing. Um, as Mark said, this whole area of dark ads is actually a really good example of the kind of challenging new kind of problem that we envisaged when we, when we designed, when we thought about the, what we could do with uh, a centre like the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making in Society uh, at, at the outset. Uh, thank you also, Janet, uh, for that uh, lovely uh, welcome to country and that salutary reminder uh, to us to always act uh, to come with purpose and, and, and with uh, great respect. Now, I mean, just a very brief word, I guess, uh, following Mark's comments about, about the centre. It is a national uh, centre funded mainly by the Commonwealth Government, cross-disciplinary centre, and uh, which is, which is um, really concerned to investigate the social aspects of automation, AI and, and related technologies um, uh, a, a across Australia, regionally and, and globally. Uh, so we're trying to do some new things and we're trying to do some things in, in new ways, working across disciplinary and inst institutional boundaries, working with partners in industry and a whole range of different organisations in order to get at some 
difficult problems, and the dark ads one is, is a really good ex example of that. It embodies, I think, not just the kind of problem we're interested in, but, um, but also the way in which we're trying to do a lot of, uh, a, a lot of this work. Uh, it's, it, it's an elusive, difficult research problem, difficult to get at, necessarily involves people working across disciplines, as I said, across the boundaries between the humanities and the social sciences and the STEM disciplines, also involves working with people outside universities, uh, particularly important thinking about uh, policy applications and, and other sorts of um, outcomes that uh, may be um, useful in, 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 in a number of ways. Also involves, I think, an important project in public education around these issues. This is another kind of critical aspect of, of our centre's uh, remit, generating public conversations like the one we're having tonight uh, around an issue which we all need to know a lot more about. So very lucky to, to, to have the chance to do this uh, with the people who are here. Um, the centre, the, 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 the topic tonight and, and the work we're doing in the hackathon also, I think, embodies our, our search for new methods, new tools, new approaches, uh, and, and the imperative to develop new, new data sets that can help us answer these critical questions. So that's enough from me, but I'm really looking forward to hearing a bit more of the conversation and to finding out uh, more about um, the, what, what we can learn from the, um, the amazing data sets that we have available through this project. So thanks very much, Mark. Looking forward to this. Thanks so much, Julian. I, sh I should add that <clears throat> the hackathon is a project that's part of the research uh, and training program of the uh, ARC Centre. So uh, it specifically addresses, you know, part of our mandate to um, develop capacity uh, in the area of looking at the social, cultural uh, impact of automated decision-making systems and how they can be implemented in uh, responsible, equitable uh, and fair ways. I, our, our first panel is um, going to be addressing some of the potential concerns that come up in the advertising space uh, around the use of data-driven forms of targeting to often personal devices. Um, it's wonderful to be able to assemble this group in person. Uh, these folks on both of these panels are people that we've been in conversation with in various capacities in a variety of ways, mostly on Zoom. Uh, and Zoom is a very limiting um, medium for discussion, so to be able to have this in-person panel discussion is really exciting and a wonderful opportunity, and I hope it serves as the basis for ongoing conversations. I'm going to introduce our, uh, our first panel, um, and I'll go starting from, uh, well, I, I'll skip Nick, who's the moderator, <laughs> and I'll introduce the panel, and then I'll, I'll say a little bit about uh, Nick, who's uh, moderating. Um, Dr. Amy Brownbill uh, is Senior Policy and Research Advisor at the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education, the leading not-for-profit organization working towards an Australia free from alcohol harm. Amy has a PhD in public health and has contributed to collaborative applied research informing public health policy for several years. In her role at FAIR, Amy integrates her knowledge and experience in research policy and advocacy to achieve translational outcomes in public health policy and practice. She's currently leading a portfolio of work on digital marketing by harmful industries, such as alcohol, gambling, and highly processed unhealthy foods, exploring potential avenues for regulation in this space. Lucy Westerman uh, is the a Commercial Determinants of Health Lead for Vic Health. Lucy works at the Victorian Health Promotion Foundation at Vic Health, exploring the ways in which businesses, products, and practices influence health and how to mitigate their harms. She recently returned from living in the UK, where she led global campaigns and the chronic disease prevention and health promotion policy and advocacy work at the global NGO, the NCD Alliance, in pursuit of stronger and better policy for disease prevention. 
Uh, through her career today, Lucy has sharpened her focus on alcohol, gambling, tobacco, food, and physical inactivity, looking at, at upstream and cross-cutting issues such as the influence of social, political, commercial, and environmental determinants on health and illness. Lucy holds a Master of Public Health and Bachelor's Degree in Health Promotion, Sociology, and Nutrition, and is mother to two teenagers. Um, <clears throat> Kate Bauer is a consumer data advocate at Choice. Australia's largest consumer advocacy organization. The consumer data team extends Choice's fight for fair, safe, and just markets to data misuse, such as price discrimination and algorithmic bias. Current prior priorities are automated decision-making and essential services, data monetization, and personalized pricing. Kate was an academic for more than a decade, then she got better. No, <laughs> uh, working, working, <laughs> working across a range of areas, including qualitative health research, higher education, and gender studies. She has a PhD from the University of Technology, Sydney, and a Bachelor of Arts with honors from the University of New South Wales. Erin Turner is Chief Executive Officer uh, at the Consumer Policy Research Center, CPRC. Erin is a consumer advocate who has worked with a broad range of governments and regulators to make markets fairer for Australians. Erin was appointed as Chief Executive Officer of the CPRC in March 2022. She most recently led the advocacy and communications team at Consumer Group Choice. Erin has a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Politics and Public Policy. She's a board member of the Australian Financial Complaints Authority and the chair of the Financial Rights Legal Center. And moderating tonight's discussion will be Nick Cara, who's Director of Digital Cultures and Societies at the University of Queensland, where he's also an Associate Professor in the School of Communication and Arts. Uh, and Nick is an Associate Investigator in the ARC Center for Automated Decision Making and Society. Uh, thanks to all of you. I'm going to turn it over to Nick. Thanks, Mark. Um, wonderful to see you all tonight. Um, I, I'm going to just start off by saying what having an attempt at what are dark ads and, and how did we get here. Uh, and I think to kind of go back a little bit, um, advertising in the 20th century by its very definition was public. It was, it, it, as Mark often says, was part of a broader logic of publicity. And so it's actually incredibly historically strange to pull ads out of the public domain in a sense. Um, but that's what we've done over the last couple of decades, or it's what digital platforms have done. And advertising has gone dark in two ways. Uh, the first way is that the ads themselves have disappeared from view. So in, in, the, in the mass media era, if you wanted to see ads, you could switch on the television and find them or find them on billboards in the street. Um, you could pick up a newspaper and you could figure out what advertisers were doing simply by looking at those mass media channels. Uh, but in the present era, ads flow through digital platforms. They flow underneath our thumbs on the screens of our phone and they're only visible to the individuals who are targeted at that particular moment in time and then they disappear. Uh, and the second part of it is that advertising is now no longer really just ads and the content in ads. It's um, a, a, a series, really, of complicated algorithmic and automated models. And that's at the heart of the machinery. And this machinery is kind of completely unknown to the public in some respects. And this matters because uh, for, for any kind of sense we have of, of how advertising might be made accountable to the public rests on the idea um, that, that the public can view the ads, that we can observe advertising. Um, and we need to observe it because ads play such a fundamental role in shaping our public life. And for some categories of products, um, we have real questions and concerns about um, vulnerable consumers and, and harmful products that we need to be able to address collectively. So I want to start out uh, tonight by asking this uh, wonderful panel of experts on this um, why do dark ads matter to you? <laughs> Why do you uh, spend so much time thinking about them? What concerns you um, about them? Uh, and I might start with Kate. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yes, um, I think you've stolen a bit of my thunder, Nick. I was oh, going to start with a similar, oh, similar argument about advertising. <laughs> um, so I think the first prompt that you gave us to think about this evening was um, a provocation. What's a provocation right. of what you want to say? So I think obviously what you've pointed out is like the darkness um, of things that were once public. Um, are now are now hidden, um, but I, I took the liberty of looking up a few definitions of uh, advertising. Let me see if I can uh, the ever trusty Wikipedia. It's not going to work now. So we've got no. Uh, oh, no. 
it's not going to work, I'm just going to wing it. Wing it. Um, <laughs> wing it. One of which is that they were, in fact, public, but the other word that came up in many definitions was non-personal. Right. Um, so that advertising is something that is in public and it's something that's non-personal. -person um, and there's also, I think, like a creative element to it. So I think the provocation that I would bring um, to this evening is not just the darkness of ads, but are we even talking about advertising when mm. we're talking about what the hyper-personalisation that's happening in social media and on digital platforms? It's not so much just the hiddenness of it, but the fact that it may in fact be AI generated, it may not even have person's involvement, it might be hyper-personalised, not just to the extent of, um, say, women under certain category. It could be people with this interest, that interest, and this interest combined who live in this specific location, who have two cats and one dog and three children. You know, like, that's the kind of level of personalisation that's possible because of the huge database of information. So if we're thinking about, like, what's this hyper-personalised thing, this thing that we're looking at, if we think about it as not just an ad, well, what other kind of thing is it? Um, and what is it doing mm -hmm. to us? And what kind of harms might be possible when we're t thinking about it? I think about like the history um, of advertising, if we're thinking about that way, from like the kind of hyper-creative madman era mm -hmm. to the meta era, mm -hmm. where creativity kind of goes out the window and instead it's like whatever is the most manipulative form um, that gets you to do the thing. Um, had the pleasure of seeing um, Kevin Roos from New York Times speak about a week and a half ago um, in Sydney. Um, and, you know, and he kind of talked about this um, idea that it's not just, um, see if I can get his words right, <laughs> it's not just that the machines read us, they lead us, mm. right? So in fact, it's not just that we're seeing certain types of ads, they're actually contributing to our consumer behaviour and the choices that we're, we're making in our life. So from, I think, from a policy angle, from a consumer organisation angle, that's, that's the relevant bit. So it's thinking mm. about, we have a current framework around, um, say, like, for, I'm going to let, Erin talk about the consumer law angle more. Uh, that's more of her expertise. But, you know, this idea of false and misleading and, and certain things are not allowed in public advertising. But if instead if we think about it not as advertising, what is this thing? What is it doing to us? Um, what kinds of in manipulations and enticements are happening? Um, and what kind of policy settings um, and consumer framework do we need um, to make sure that we have the same protections um, that, that we currently enjoy? Yeah, thank you. I really like this idea of that if we, just by calling them ads, we smuggle in a whole bunch of assumptions about what advertising is. It's about what it looked like in the 20th century and um, there's actually all these other aspects of the apparatus that, that, um, that maybe advertising is an inadequate term in a sense. Um, uh, Lucy, why does, <laughs> sorry, why does dark advertising... Yeah, yeah, why? I mean, for me, there's a professional side, obviously. I'm really passionate about preventing disease. Um, and when we can do it, for example, through things like tackling alcohol and ultra-processed foods and reducing the amount that they're in people's lives, then I think that that's a great thing. Um, I think incre increasingly we're realising that the producers of those products aren't the only problem. <laughs> so we actually need to start looking at the vehicles that are getting those products into our lives. And in the public health space, I don't know that that has fully dawned on everybody who's trying to focus on improved nutrition and reducing alcohol use and tackling gambling problems. I think it's still, this, the dawn is still arriving. arriving. Mm. So what I love about these conversations is that they are engaging different perspectives and voices and skills and expertise to come together and really explore the different ways we see you know, consumer rights and, and opportunities to have safe spaces that you operate in from very different perspective. I also come from a very personal perspective as well. As mentioned in my introduction, I have two teenagers. One's nearly 16 and one is nearly 18. Um, and they see completely different things to what I see online. And they tell me about it, thank goodness, they tell me. So I hear that they are seeing the sports betting ads when they're watching things, whereas I'm seeing advertisements for going and sunning ourselves in a, a holiday destination in the Pacific Islands. They may be seeing... Um, what was it, you know, fried chicken with Coke deals, whereas I'm seeing cocktails, summer cocktails uh, advertisements. And, you know, one of my sons recently told me about miniature sushi rollers. Now, I don't know if anyone else knows what I'm talking about here, <laughs> but 
it doesn't have sushi rice in it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I find it incredibly unsettling that my kids are being exposed to products and concepts and ideas, and I can't just switch it off. They have been exposed and, you know, unfilled. The Department of Education has said, get online. You know, only way that you're going to learn in, in these past couple of years is online. So they're online. You can't switch it off as a parent. And it's out of my control. And it's out of so many parents' control. And I think we really, need, we really need to regain that as a community and not let bigger businesses whose profits are the main incentive behind what they're doing be the ones who are driving what our children and we are seeing. Mm. Yeah. I, it, I think it's really important, these, these things that we experience in the kind of intimacy of our homes as individual challenges are, in fact, you know, problems shared in common, and this is the public part of it, right? Um, the, the nature of the challenge, so that's yeah, really important. Erin, um, why do dark ads matter? <laughs> um, I, I think of this in two ways. It's the dark part and the ads part. Right. Um, I, actually, if you want to boil it down, I think this matters because ultimately the data set and what you're looking at, you're looking at a, a series of points that have the potential to cause harm and quite likely are. These are things that can hurt people. And when we think about why ads are regulated or why the consumer law captures bad business behaviour that can express itself in ads or things we might call ads, um, it, it's because of that potential to cause harm. So I think as you, you, I guess one of the main reasons why it matters is because you're likely going to find things like misleading statements, uh, outright lies. Um, we're seeing all sorts of trends that, um, you know, soft or hard claims around the sustainability of a product that may or may not be true. And this is something that manipulates people and it causes them to lose money. And it also manipulates markets. Um, businesses have to compete against other businesses that aren't always doing the right thing. And I guess the other, the other half of the equation is the dark part. The reason why this matters so much is because unlike, like you covered so well, um, when I started my career, I could see what businesses were doing as a consumer advocate. I could open the paper, I could watch TV, and I'd be like, oh, that dodgy Telstra ad, I know exactly what they're telling all of their customers. I could go on their website and the same ad that I saw in the paper would be on the front page. But there's no transparency. There's no accountability now. So academics, public advocates, um, interested parties in the media, we can't hold very powerful groups, big businesses, to account in the same way we could even five or ten years ago. And, and that's why this matters so much. It, it, it means we can't look at the harms that we once did, but also we can't look closely at the harms that are now exacerbated and new because of this new technology. Uh, we can't look at personalised pricing in the same way. We can't look at the manipulation that comes with large data sets and digital platforms. So there's, there's so much potential harm. And it's it's why it's so great to see a project like this where you are looking closely, because I think you're going to find some pretty shocking things. Mm. Thank you. Um, Amy? Yes, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to echo what you've said, Erin, because I think of it in the same way. You've got the ads um, side of it and you've got the harm, the uh, dark side of it, and both of that is about harm and the potential for harm. So if I sort of just step back a moment and when we think about advertising for um, harmful and addictive products like alcohol, we already know that alcohol advertising, you know, um, really affects people's perceptions, um, uh, so they have more positive attitudes towards alcohol um, and that, that, that they then will use more alcohol. Um, and when we're speaking about children, for example, we also know that when they're exposed to alcohol advertising, that they're more likely to um, initiate alcohol use at younger ages and then to go on and drink at riskier levels. So we already know that a lot of harm can be done from alcohol advertising, generally speaking. And then digital marketing has just created this whole new landscape um, and type of advertising and the potential for harm is even greater because of the way that the digital marketing systems are designed. Um, so I guess that's sort of why FAIR we're really focusing on, uh, I mean, all marketing but digital marketing, specifically what the way that the systems are designed and how they might be creating harm um, when it comes to alcohol. So I, I, I echo what you're saying there and sort of splitting up both of those. And when it comes to alcohol advertising, as you've said, we know a lot of it is under the radar. We can't see it, um, which makes it really hard when we're trying to speak to policymakers um, or even speak to the public about this issue because um, unless you're the person getting that ad targeted directly to you, it might be really hard to understand just how big these problems are. Um, I might leave it there because I know yeah. we're... 
No, that's great. I mean, I've got a question for you to, the, the, um, so I'll st I'll, we'll, st we'll stay with you for a minute, um, it, which is this kind of like, how dark are they? Um, and I'm thinking here of this um, work that we did with FAIR um, this year, uh, where we set out to kind of audit the the darkness, if you like, of the of the ad model of platforms. And we thought at the start of that we'd give them a kind of rating of how dark they were. Um, anyway, what did we find yes. when, we, when we looked at this? <laughs> yes, so in this bit of work we've just done, um, and, and it really came about because we, we were trying to get a sense of how much alcohol advertising there is on these digital platforms, and um, we were discovering it's really hard to do that. So we really wanted to get a better sense of what advertising transparency the major digital platforms are providing. And I guess the top line is, not much. <laughs> um, really, you know, these digital platforms are saying that they're providing advertising transparency, but they really are doing the very bare minimum. Um, some of them aren't even doing that. Uh, so one of the things we were assessing for is um, whether they have like an archive of ads, sort of as just like a basic um, level of transparency. And most of them, they don't. Um, when you consider sort of the definition of, uh, um, of an archive as we sort of were talking about sort of as we were doing this project, you know, you need some sort of sense of it being sort of a comprehensive record, of there being um, some permanency and the ads that are going out on these digital platforms um, and what little, I mean, we can't even call it an archive, like f the Facebook ad library, for example, you know, that disappears once the advertising isn't um, live anymore. So. That, that really doesn't count um, as sort of an archive. And the other thing we were looking for is in terms of what kind of information about the ads we could sort of gather from what's um, being uh, given by these platforms. And again, uh, very little. So in terms of, you know, what are the targeting criteria? What's even the spend? What's the reach of these, um, these advertisements? There's really very little mm. that they're providing. Um, although I guess well, I'll note for... <laughs> with the exception for political or this narrow category of political or um, sort of other issues based um, advertising. And for that, um, you know, there is a bit of a, you know, there's, a, there's an archive, there's a little bit of this information. Again, I think some, most of us would probably argue there's still not enough information that's even been provided for these. But what that really showed us is that it's technically feasible. They can give us this information. They're choosing not to give us this information. Um, so really, you have to ask why. Why aren't they giving us this information? Right, it's a good question. And I, I, look, I think just to, to emphasize that the, the, the capacity of the platforms to turn around and offer a level of observability around political advertising because of the pressure to do so, yeah, d sort of you know, lays out that it's, there's no technical barrier here, which is what we sometimes hear, but it's, it's not the case. Um, I think it really sets the baseline kind of in an important way. I, I just remember we, we created this table when we did that, and we kind of had a green square for any criteria. I think, you know, we were going to give them a green square for any criteria they satisfied. I think we had one green square on the entire, on the entire map, um, and that was just simply that Facebook's provide you a searchable dashboard, <laughs> do you know? Um, so I think this is a really, you know, the baseline is in a sense so low for where we're at here. Um, Kate, I, I wanted to kind of turn our attention a little toward this question of, um, I guess, the way in which consumer rights and, in a sense, the mythology of consumer culture is really centred on this idea of, of choice um, and, and of competition. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, why does, yeah, why does choice matter? Why is that really fundamental to the kind of public consumer culture that we have? Yeah, it's so fundamental we named our organisation after well, it, Well, you right? did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think this is... Um, I think it's really good to start this conversation with this idea of harmful products and harmful advertising because kind of the question that I kind of struggle with, I'm like, okay, so I can see um, having alcohol ads hidden, that it, the, the harm to me is quite clear about that. But, like, what if it's a choice of toothpaste or shampoo? Right. Right. Like, does it matter if I'm only seeing a limited choice um, of products or that the products that I'm seeing have been hyper-targeted, hyper-personalised to me? Um, and, and to what extent, now that we're starting to live in this world where... Um, not just the ads, if we're going to call them that, um, but the, the media itself, uh, synthetic media, um, increasing hyper-personalisation, personalised pricing, frictionless supermarkets, uh, you know, like examples, say, in airports of um, where they've now got an example using facial recognition of being able to show 100 people their flight information on a personal scale. So, like, this idea of hyper-personalisation is actually not just advertising, it's, a, right. it's across the board. So I kind of think about it in that framework. Um, and I think that's where choice becomes um, 
choice is the, the consumer superpower. Um, if you think about it. So when we're dealing with a world of big businesses and big corporations with all of the power, with all of your data, where consumers have been able to exercise their power is through, is through choice, is through consumer choice. Um, having that bargaining power of knowing what products are, you know, people talk about, you know, leading with your feet, you'll just shop somewhere else. Um, certainly that was some of the response we got from our facial recognition of, I'm never going into Kmart again. Um, you know, so this idea that you can choose differently, I think is really crucial and is kind of the, like the centrepiece um, of consumer rights in this country. So when that choice is taken away or when it's severely limited um, to the point where hyper-personalisation is only a couple of, um, you know, it's only what Facebook wants you to see, it's only what Amazon wants to show you on their platform, um, and we, we get market concentration, um, that's when those competition issues really kind of come to the fore. But also, um, consumers lose their powers. Uh, you know, they don't know what they're seeing is hyper-personalised. They don't know how it, how it was decided to be there. They don't know what other options are available. Um, you're, you're kind of limited to what you see on the screen. Um, and I think that has fundamental consequences uh, for consumer rights. It really means we have to think much more broadly and not just like false and misleading on that particular ad, but how is the whole system actually misleading or manipulative and right. start thinking more broadly about what kind of like um, kind of cross-sectional policy rules do we need um, to deal with the competition and consumer issues together um, now that they're all part of this kind of hyper-personalised integrated system um, that we're all kind of forced to live in. And, and you get this kind of like um, this shift in of thinking of choice as not just like an individual capacity that we might have to form a judgment and make a decision, but but choice as a kind of environment, right? A, a kind of um, an architecture that's available to us, right? And, and do you have a sense, um, you know, individually or at choice, <laughs> that um, that this that that like what is it about? Like, is it that the environment has become a much more significant issue here in the digital era? Um, the choice environment, in a sense, rather than our individual information and capacities. And do you have a particular, I don't know, illustrative example of what that looks like <laughs> oh, for, for yeah, us in our Yeah, lives? that's a good question. Do I have an example? Put yeah, me on the spot. that's a tricky bit. Uh, no, um, look, I think, yeah, I think, it, I, think it's, I think it's two things. I think it matters what the specific, um, you know, media or ad that is that you're seeing um, and looking at that individually and, and what potential harms can come from that. And I certainly think... Um, when we're talking about gambling ads and when we're talking about alcohol, the ad itself uh, can be harmful. But I do think that there also needs to be a strong focus on um, the architecture of the entire system um, and the way that data is being used against people um, and the fact that so much of our economy now is driven on, on people sharing their data and so many um, ad tech businesses um, and things that are other businesses, media businesses and real estate right. businesses and buy now, pay later businesses are also data businesses. Um, and all, all of that is contributing to, um, I think, th this culture that we have now um, where our data is consistently sold um, and used against us. Right. Um, and so that anything that we need to do, we need to look at, um, at both problems at once. Right. Erin, um, I think in a similar way, you, you know, in, in your organisation, you've, you've talked particularly about dark patterns. Um, and you know, what, what is a dark pattern and how does that threaten the yeah. capacity to choose? And, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's probably similar, it's put in a similar category to a dark ad. It's hard mm. to see. Um, so we've actually done a study on dark patterns, which for us is a manipulative web design. Um, it's, I'd say if you did a Venn diagram, that it would cut across some dark ads, but not all dark ads. Um, essentially, it's a, it's a point where a business uses its power, its a bit, a knowledge of web design, its knowledge of human weaknesses and decision making, the information it has about you to steer your choices, that information architecture, they use that so that you are more likely to make a decision where you lose, but they benefit. You're more likely to keep your subscription. You're more likely to click on an ad that didn't actually look like an ad. Maybe it's a, you know, it looked like a news article or it looked like a post from your friend and it, it was severely disguised. You're more likely to accept those cookies or hand over your email address or other data. Um, that this is essentially dark patterns are when a business uses its power so they win and you lose. Um, and this is, I, I think, a lot of commonalities with dark ads. Um, I, I, I suspect you might see some dark patterns in your work. I, I'd really encourage you to look for them. Um, things like false scarcity, 
for example, um, ads that might say, oh, there's only two left, or there's only three in Melbourne, or th that create that fear of missing out and that the really tap into the, that very human thing of, oh gosh, I've got to act now and pushes you into it. Um, so I think there's, there's potentially some really interesting dark pattern elements in the data sets you're looking at. And, you know, how do you know? <laughs> how do you know as an individual um, that you're the, the subject of a dark pattern or the, yeah? I think this is one of the trickiest things around dark ads and dark patterns. You, you may not. Mm. Um, it's where businesses are using their power in a way that really isolates consumers and removes their, their power of choice. Um, you might not know, for example, that you are receiving a different price from someone else or that even your decision is being steered or that you might have made a different decision if it was presented in a different way. Sometimes you might know. Um, one of the dark patterns we looked at is the Hotel California. Uh, you can get in, but you can never leave. Um, the subscription mm. traps. Mm. So, you know, I think you, it's pretty obvious when you it's very easy to subscribe to something and it's very, very hard to figure out how many hoops you have to jump through to get out if you can at all. Mm. But other, other dark patterns are deliberately obfuscating what's happening, like um, hidden advertising, usually. Mm. I think it's a, that's something that I think is quite common on a lot of social platforms. Ads that aren't, they don't look like ads or they might look like ads for one thing but they're for something else. And, and they're the kind of things that... Um, they really do take away our power to, to choose and our, our power to engage in a market. Right. right. Can I jump yes, in then? You, I'm just you can. to that too. Like influencer culture on social media, yeah. is that advertising or right. is it not, right? Like, you know, right. this is... Very blurred line. Yeah, 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 it's a very blurred line. There are people who are getting paid to talk about things and use things, but they're not shown as ads. Right. So, you know, again, that's the part of, like, the whole framework of ways that you're tricked or manipulated or encouraged, enticed into doing sort of certain behaviours which are like so far removed from what we would traditionally see as advertising and for which our rules were created for. Right, right. And, um, you know, to kind of um, push this, uh, 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 you know, to in a particular kind of direction, I, one of the things we were talking about this afternoon um, is, is in a sense who's vulnerable. Like some of us are, are more vulnerable than others. and. Um, um, you know, like in, in some of the work at FAIR, I, I, you know, I always muck this statistic up, but um, so you'll, you can correct me if I get this quite, but it's something like 25% of Australians consume 75% of the alcohol um, sold in Australia. Is that right? Or is I it? I think you've got it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, and do you know, so why, um, in a sense, who's particularly vulnerable to dark advertising and, 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 um, and in what ways does that, von you know, in what ways that vulnerability become clear? Um, yeah. That's a question, I think, for, for you, Amy, but also for Lucy. Yeah, I might perhaps, start. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it's a tricky question because I kind of almost want to flip it and be like, how is the, the actual system, like, right. geared towards creating harm rather right. than placing it on the individuals who are vulnerable? But, sure. yeah. I mean, in terms of what we know, we know that this, the data-driven programmatic advertising model is designed in a way that... It's, it's actively looking for those people who are most likely to, um, to interact with an advertisement um, and particularly those who are going to sort of either click through or in other ways sort of go on to purchase a product. So they're looking for people who are sort of those high value customers, the people who are, who are purchasing more, um, purchasing more frequently. And when you think about harmful and addictive products like alcohol, that means that um, it's the people who are you know, likely the ones using the most alcohol that are the ones that are going to be targeted with these ads the most. And, you know, they're already consuming um, alcohol in amounts that are really quite risky and putting them at risk. And um, Nick's alluded there to, you know, the fact that there is this um, concentration of a lot of alcohol going to um, a smaller group of people. Um, but more generally speaking, I think, you know, it's... This is all by design. Mm. <laughs> um, so... And it's not, you know, just this group of people, but the, the model is really trying to find any sort of personal susceptibilities that you might have. And then they're trying to, um, the model's trying to learn and generate advertising content that's going to appeal to any one particular person as well. Um, uh, in terms of alcohol marketing online, um, so like we said, you know, if the advertising, most of it's going to people who are sort of using high amounts, we need to think about what harm could be done in terms of um, 
you know, people who might be um, experiencing or recovering from alcohol addiction, for example. Um, and at the moment, there's no way for us to know that these people aren't being targeted with alcohol advertising. Everything that we know points to it being extremely likely that that's what's happening. Mm. I mean, what, do you have a sense of this at Vic Health, Lucy, in your work there? Um, you know, in what ways is the model particularly predatory? Uh, as I, I like Amy's reframing, do you know, <laughs> away from the, yeah, yeah, no, and it's it's interesting, Amy's reframing, because I was thinking as we were going through the conversation, we used to talk about a lot of chronic diseases as lifestyle diseases <laughs> that had yeah. lifestyle choices associated with them. It's not about choice. Choices are manipulated. Mm. Addiction doesn't drive, you know, addiction drives a lot of activity and behaviour. It's not that someone is necessarily choosing to go back for another drink. It's the, the advertisement that's triggering that behaviour or um, driving the, the desire to go to that subway restaurant that smells so good and you know there are there are particular ways that people are manipulated so we've got to stop talking about choice in the sense that you actually have full agency because you don't your your physical environment and your digital environment are manipulating those choices and unfortunately I, I'm, I think that we've got to recognize that the, the pace of change in this digital landscape has been so rapid that regulations around it and the standards around it that are applied to businesses have not kept pace. And so we are not protecting children. We know that there's around about 13, uh, around about 72 million data points that are gathered on every child up before the age of 13. That is a huge amount of information that's gathered that is going to then be used to manipulate their choices and their behaviour. So I think we need to be a lot better at gathering the evidence that this is, this is happening and what is actually happening, and that's why the darkness is such a big problem, but use that to really inform an improvement in standards as well and regulation that then responds to that. How do we actually monitor it and enforce it properly? And I think that there are definitely tools out there that, that mm. can help us to do that. Yeah, maybe since you since you kind of headed in that direction, can I ask, um, you know, at, at Vic Health, what are some of the ways in which you're kind of taking up that particular um, that particular challenge? We're doing a few things. So the the marketing space is sort of a bit of an umbrella across these harmful industries areas. Um, we are we're engaged in sort of local environment uh, advocacy, so supporting Cancer Council and the Obesity Policy Coalition, for example, on a campaign called Food Fight to try and get uh, junk food advertising off bus stops, you know, traditional advertising, important to do. But then at the next level, we're engaging researchers and partners like FAIR to start really digging into this dark space. And we recently ran a, an initiative with Launch Vic. I know that some of our um, Launch Vic team are here as well, uh, to challenge startups to come up with solutions to help solve some of these problems around identifying the advertising and then being able to monitor and surveil it and, and deal with it better. Um, we've also been building literacy because we know that the digital marketing space is not going to be regulated as quickly as we need it to be. So we need communities to also start having that increased awareness of the, the way that um, advertising affects their behaviour and their choices. And so we've um, paired up with Museums Victoria to do a, a series of workshops with young people, with adolescents. Uh, we've teamed up with the Alara Madeline Foundation, again, to build literacy through some modules to help, help young people understand what's happening. But these are not the only solution, and I sort of go back to the point that the, the regulations really need to be a lot stricter, a lot tighter, um, and sort of set a, san set a standard that is actually um, keeping up with what we need it to be. In making that move where, uh, you know, as a public health foundation, you engage with startups who both bring a, a different way of working in terms of um, challenges and problem solving, but also a kind of a market-based logic about, you know, what, um, what solutions look like and, and what happens next. What, you, what's been your experience? Has that been a kind of path-breaking in, in terms of the thinking about, um, you know, who the new coalitions are and so on. I'm just curious what, what, you, what that move looks like. Does it feel like yeah. a new move to make and, and what have you learned from it? I think it's really exciting. Right. Um, I, I've really enjoyed it. Um, the people we've been speaking to are coming at, coming at the challenge of digital marketing, not from the same perspective as, of, you know, alcohol's a problem, maybe it's not to them. Right. Or junk food's a problem that doesn't necessarily resonate. Some of them came to us and said, okay, we see that marketing's a problem, but actually we're seeing vaping as an issue. We're seeing e-cigarette advertising actually as a bigger issue than what you're talking about. Can we go and explore that? Yeah, go for it, because that's also an issue for us. Because at the end of the day, the solutions that 
tech teams come up with can then be translated into other spaces that we're trying to understand. So if young people in particular are being targeted or if um, communities that are higher users or in lower socioeconomic communities, if there are, t if there are particular targeting of, of these products in those areas, we can start to really distill that down and call out the fact that there's an injustice in the way data is being used in the way that people are being targeted and really push harder for the, the sort of the regulatory landscape that needs to be strengthened. Mm. It has been quite radical and I've been really excited by it. I know the team, it's, it's difficult, it's a language that we don't understand, you know, <laughs> when, it, when I'm sure Amy's had similar sort of situations where you to say that again, um, I don't fully get it, but it's been really empowering, I think, and to see things from a different perspective, you can really start to have these win-win solutions. You know, you're not just focusing on public health as right. the end goal. You're, you're focusing on consumer rights and, you know, us as humans and how we can exist in a society where we can be in harmony, you know, with the environment that we're in. So, yeah, mm. it's been great. Mm. Yeah, I find that really, yeah, novel and interesting and generative, actually, to, to be part of that kind of process and observe it. Um, uh, maybe Erin and also Kate, I, I kind of have this question about, um, do you know, um, we, we, you know, as Amy was saying, like one of the problems we seem to face is there's just no archive of ads. Like, how do you even look at it? But say we could look at it, because we kind of, we're taking on that challenge here in this, in this hackathon over the next few days. Um, um, so say we had an archive of ad or we, we, we ads and we, we made the, the dark ad model more observable. Um, what, why do we want that? What should we go looking for? <laughs> so I have a wish list. <laughs> yeah, um, so if anyone wants here's it, your, here's your chance. Is there people in the room who are thinking about this? So what's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I, will, I will literally. It's printed out here. I will give it to anyone who needs it. Um, but there's probably two areas that we haven't focused in on as much yet that I think are worth a little bit of time: scams and personalization. There's lots of harms that come from ads related to misleading and deceptive conduct, manipulation, dark patterns. But I think. We've touched on them a bit. Uh, one thing I am incredibly interested in is the degree of pricing personalization, because that co there is a very likely, very specific harm that comes from that. Um, we know that there are some businesses out there that are giving some customers a discount different to others. Um, and we accept that to discount. some degree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> discount, different price, they're charging some people more than other people. And uh, personalized pricing isn't always harmful. We accept it. We know that you know, there might be a senior's discount at cinema or there might be a student discount for transport, but that's public. What we don't know is why is, for example, a piece of work that Kate and I worked on earlier in our careers, uh, why is Tinder, a dating app, charging one person $40 a month for their subscription versus $16 a month for someone else? Mm. And I, am, I would love to see any ads where one group of people is being offered a discount price offer that is different to another, because you're quite likely looking at discrimination there. Um, you know, it might be that women are paying more than men or older people are paying more than younger people. It's not always what a business intends. They might be just looking for, I want people who like the color green and get up early on Sundays, but they aren't not always looking at the outcome of those decisions. So any, any kind of personalization factor, particularly related to price, there's a, there's a subset of harm there that would be so useful to look at. Mm. The other thing we're seeing a lot in um, advertising and just generally all over the internet is scams. Um, I think social platforms have done a, they've, they've tried to do a bit of work, but they've done a relatively poor job of so stopping ads that are leading straight to scam websites or gathering details and then used in ways that cause consumers harm through scams. It'd be really interesting to know what obvious scams are there and what are platforms doing or not doing to stop them. Okay. Yeah, what's, your, what's I, on I your agree wish with list? both of those. I right. think, um, yeah, personalised pricing is definitely, definitely a big, big issue, and I think it's one of the hardest things to find out. When oh, yeah. um, the Choice Consumer Data Team started, we thought we'll start with personalised pricing because you know we know it's out there, but it was like it's the hardest nut to crack. Like you just, mm. it's really hard to find um, examples. Um, but yeah, I would agree with that. And certainly scams, like if you think of what's happened with Optus uh, data breach, the fact right. that that kind of data out there is just open season on scams. Like that is just, I mean, and identity theft, but that's for another panel. Um, <laughs> but essentially that kind of information can be misused um, so rapidly. And the fact that there's no accountability, no transparency over scam ads, um, ads that lead people directly to harm, and that, that's 
scams are an immediate harm. Mm. Um, like some of the harms we've been talking about is, is cumulative or, yeah. or you know, it, uh, after a certain point in time. Scams are a, a direct harm um, that can happen straight away. Um, you know, it's kind of the question of um, we're, we're optimised, everything's optimised for the short term, like for the next click. Um, the social media systems, the digital platforms, uh, the, the other websites where we're seeing um, any type of digital advertising appearing. So, you know, it's, I think it's worth thinking about, like, what other ways of thinking about optimising um, would there be? Like, what if we optimise for the long term? What would that look like? Um, what kind of differences would we see? But, yeah, definitely that. But ultimately, I think anyone who's in the hackathon, find us a scandal. Right? Like how we got into the transparency of political advertising was a massive, right. massive scandal right. was Cambridge Analytica, right? Like yeah. people were like, this is affecting elections. This is affecting the fundamental of democracy. The more that we can uncover that this is affecting real people and creating real harms, um, the better, the easier our jobs are as advocates yeah. um, to make the case of why we need stronger laws to yeah. protect us. Well, the biggest thing, we can't know if businesses are doing the right thing or not if we can't see it. So I, I really am looking forward to the results of this, and I think it's a really great start to get into that. Transparency is the precondition for fairness, so right. this is hugely right. important work. Um, I got one more question that's kind of wacky, uh, but then we're going to go for some, to some Q and A. So, but uh, and this is, for, I mean, this is for for any of you, but maybe more for Lucy and Amy. Um, <coughs> pardon me, um, which is. Can the dark advertising model be used for good? Like, you're doing health promotion and you're using digital uh, media platforms to reach the public. Um, is it always harmful or are there the good uses of it? Um, or how do you feel about this? I think it's such a great and important question. I think whenever we talk about regulation and banning advertising this, that and the other and stop the targeting, you've got to actually think about it on the flip side. And think about... <laughs> You know, health promotion cam campaigns around physical activity. This girl can just ran last uh, last week, the week before, by Vic Health, and that was encouraging women to feel like they can be active wherever they are, whenever they are. Just be active. More often, it feels good. Um, health promotion campaigns around healthy eating. You know, mm. how do you actually you know learn to make healthier food from fresh produce? There, you know, there's plenty of things. And historically, we can go back to the pandemic and the vaccination promotions and wearing masks. That was also you know targeting was used in that. So there is use if it is in public interest. But we do still need to be careful about how, how that targeting is being done. And I think there are still some questions around, around those, those lines, this blurriness around the defining of harmful. I, I am sure that Amy deals with this question all the time because there are plenty of people who don't want to think of alcohol as harmful. It is. But don't want to think of it as harmful and therefore there's a huge amount of cognitive dissonance in terms of defining it in such a way. Um, but I do think that, you know, that's part of this challenge, I guess, when we're, when we're talking about what is going to be policy relevant, for example, there's a, there's a regulation at the moment, um, or there's a, Safety Scamps is looking to table uh, junk food marketing restrictions, uh, potentially in Parliament. It's a really interesting opportunity. One of the things when we talk about targeting, it's often that, um, often around the world, we've seen examples where targeting of children is banned in certain circumstances. So you can't target a child with alcohol advertising. But the question, as you were saying before, there's a lot of self-regulation where they're saying, yeah, yeah, we're doing it, we're doing it. We don't know. There's no transparency. We don't know what they're doing. And even if they, they are doing it, what are they defining as targeting and, and how are they getting away with it? So I think having that information helps us to say self-regulation is not working. The targeting point is not working because kids are seeing it. There's a huge amount of exposure that's happening, but we're, we're just not aware. Mm. Um, and, and there are good ways to sort of use that health promotion message and the targeting, but we need to be a lot more careful with how we, how we define it. Amy, yeah. FAIR's running a huge health promotion <laughs> campaign at the moment, one of the biggest in Australia, really, and, and one of the things I've observed is I've never seen any of the ads in the wild, and it's kind of interesting, right? That, so yeah. what, do you, what do you make of this? Yeah, um, and, you know, Digital media gives us this whole new um, way to reach people. And, I, I mean, I, I would echo sort of everything that Lucy said. I don't think we need the dark part of it, though. Right. <laughs> like, it doesn't right. need to be huh. hidden. Um, and I think, you know, we've spoken a lot about the digital marketing system it, itself and the way that that's designed. And I think that, you know, all the things we're talking about still stand. We would still want these systems to be designed in a way that aren't going to cause harm 
regardless of who's using it, whether that's alcohol companies or whether it's um, health promotion companies. Like, that all still stands. So I think there's still all these measures that need to be put in place, and I don't think that would affect sort of um, what we're doing. But I think it's a really important question that we need to ask ourselves, and we need to make sure that, you know, we are um, using this system really ethically ourselves as well. And, right. Um, yeah, it, it, I think that the, the, regulate, the regulatory sort of framework still needs to be there. We still need these protections for regardless of who's using them to make sure that harm's not being created. Yeah, agreed. We should go to questions. Mm. Can I, while <laughs> we're oh, finding some yes, questions, Kate, can I then, build yes, yes, on uh, these points? Um, sorry to harp on about hyper-personalisation, but I've really got to be in my bonnet about it tonight. Um, is when we're living in this hyper-personalised situation, right, yeah. it, feels good, right? We get to live in our bubble, the Spotify playlist suggestions are what we want to hear, the news is what we want to see in our news app that we go to that's curated directly for us. We don't get to experience other people's points of view and that's actually a civil society loss. So I think public health promotion, obviously there's a monetary benefit of being able to target it, right? Like it's cheaper because it just goes to the people who need to see it. But it's actually beneficial to all of us right. to learn about other people's health problems um, mm. and yes. learn about other people's yeah. experiences and yeah. the way that other people experience the world. Yes. Um, you know, so I actually think having things more open um, is, is good. It's good for us to hear news that's not directly targeted um, to us. I mean, I'm not sure I'd extend that all the way to like neo-Nazi hate speech on the internet, but it's good to, to read news that I'm not particularly interested in or at least be aware of it. And I think the same goes for advertising and, and public health promotion campaigns, that like right. the hyper-personalised world feels delightful, um, but that's kind of the trick, right? Like that's the trick that they want us to, to fall into, this kind of manipulation of once the world's kind of curated just for us, um, we'll do whatever, do whatever they say. So, uh, yeah, I think... Yeah, like we yeah. undervalued the socialisation, yeah. the social, larger social understanding yeah. of some of these things. That's yeah. right. We're I still really a society. Just, you know, yeah. we still have to relate to other people yeah. and exist in the world, not just in our, in our bubble. Agreed. Yeah. 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 Uh, Abdul. And then we've got a question over this side as well. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, I, um, I've got a question to the entire panel. Um, so the, my understanding of dark ads is that this is a field that's still incredibly nascent, incredibly contemporary. It's only been around for so long now. And um, you know, what's been revealed by the research is that there's a lot of, um, you know, we, we, we've, we sort of grab the problem at the, the point of, of contact where we're seeing it in our news feeds um, you know, these ads are being served to us and um, through being able to publish, you know, results about these advertisements that are being served to people, we can create great reform. Um, but in the future and, you know, where this research then goes as it matures, is the vibe that we're dealing with this sort of like as a symptom of a, of a bigger problem? Is there sort of a root cause that we haven't yet touched yet? And the reason I ask this is because I feel that there is this sort of... Um, you know, the story as it goes is that Facebook was once a social network and that eventually, you know, they became a, a, a massive advertising machine and, um, you know, um, we've sort of had to fight this fight to sort of, um, you know, go up against this Goliath that um, this research is very, very hard to do. It's very, very hard to carry out. And, you know, at some stage I worry that we're going to fall into a dystopian world where people no longer actually value the, their, their own personal data. And so, um, you know, is there, do we start considering, you know, dare I say it, um, a paid version of Facebook to sort of starve the, <laughs> starve the advertiser model? Or, you know, like, what other ways do you feel, um, you know, um, just as food for thought, could we attack this problem to, to sort of bring about the reform that we want? I might. I, first of all, I think Facebook has enough money. I'm not too worried about them. But it's, it, I think you're posing a really interesting... Oh, they're pretty worried about them. At the <laughs> they moment, are, actually. I was really worried about TikTok. Um, there's a few things. One of the things I think with dark ads to think about is that a lot of business behaviour, in fact, a lot of human behaviour, when it happens in the dark, it's a, more things happen that we wouldn't accept if we were having a public discussion about it. I can't tell you how many times as a consumer advocate I've had when we present information back to a company going, like, we, f we found you doing this, and they stop it immediately to stop a public discussion, or they stop it as soon as the public discussion has been had, because that they know that it's an unacceptable practice. They know that they can't abuse renters, or they can't charge older people more money than younger people for an essential service, or whatever it is. So I think there's actually, there is a power in just saying what is happening on these platforms that will 
the transparency work that you're doing will lead to harm reduction immediately. And then when we're talking about the, the larger challenges that we have, it's a really interesting one because I, what we're seeing in our research at the Consumer Policy Research Centre is that people, but particularly actually younger people, are starting to value their data more. They're starting to realise the power of it in a different way. Um, we're, we're seeing it being used against us so often in the online world. And when I think about the online world, I want... I, I want an internet that doesn't manipulate me. I want an internet that is fair, where businesses can't abuse their power. Um, and I think that has to apply both to social platforms, whether it's Facebook, advertising platforms, um, large conglomerates, Amazon. We need to find ways where businesses interact with us on a more even keel and they aren't using the power they have to manipulate our choices. I think I might um, go to this question, because we're going to run out of time. Oh. Can you believe it? <laughs> um, so I might take this question and then... Um, and then you can respond to the foot Abdul's question or this, and then we might go to some final remarks. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, just a, a quick question. Thanks for a great panel. It's been fantastic. What would be the outcome if all the platforms suddenly said, OK, you can have all the data you want. We'll <laughs> dump it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the history of, is that often the alternative is that they will give you so much you're just flattened by it. Um, and how do you think you would counter that? It's a good question. You seem excited by the data. I, I'm horrified by that, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, to be fair, if they dumped it all, that actually creates a whole bunch of work for great people to figure out what's happening there. I, 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 I do think there's, there's always this, like, oh, I often hear from businesses, it's too hard, it's too ridiculous, it can't be done, or you won't be able to use it anyway if we release this transparent information. And I, well, try me. <laughs> <laughs> we will give it a good go. But it does take different techniques and skills, and it's, it's, I think it's why it's so exciting to have so many people with varied backgrounds, because that's how you solve this problem. Right. That you, yeah, collaborate. Yeah. I, Sorry. No, it's just, I think you can also do sampling. I mean, if we mm. take a scientific approach, you, you don't need to deal with all the data that gets dumped. I know. You can do sampling that actually gives a snapshot. And I think that's why, why this Facebook project is actually really interesting, because it doesn't tell us the full story, but it gives us a pretty good idea about what's going on. And to be able to do that in these other spaces, I think TikTok's a bit of this weird space at the moment, isn't it? We don't fully understand what's going on there, and it's not at all transparent. My kids keep saying, you should have a look, and I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to linger on it. Don't make me linger on that. I don't want that. Um, so there's, but I don't know where all that information's going, and I do know it's going somewhere. To just get a snapshot of that would tell us, same with influencers. I've got a, a research fellow who's currently looking at the top 100 influencers in Australia and what they're promoting in terms of these harmful products. But really hard to capture that. So if she can capture that and analyse that, we can then go to, you know, a, I think it was ACCC recently had a big, um, a big uh, sort of rule around financial advice being given out by non-qualified financial advisors, influencers. Um, so that crackdown, you know, comes from the fact that they know that it's happening. Same with health information that's being given, misinformation that's being given. There are, there are tools, there are mechanisms that are regulatory that can be put in place if we can prove that it's a problem. So that snapshot inf of information is really important. Mm. Mm. Agree. Yeah. I I'll add to that. It was exactly going to be my point, so well done. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's a bit of a red herring to say that you need the whole data set. You don't. It is a, would be a massive technical challenge. Like, we're just, like, look at the volume that ad observatories got already. If you could see every single ad that's served up every day on the internet, like, you just physically couldn't even store that much data and the environmental cost would be massive. <laughs> um, so I think that's, like, that's just not realistic. But you don't need it all, right? Like, you just need enough to know what's going on. Like, you just need enough evidence of harm, you just need enough clues to be able to point the finger um, to who's doing the wrong thing. Um, and then to the point about Facebook, I wish it was just Facebook, right? I wish Facebook was, was just the problem, right? The problem is ad tech, every business nearly is in ad tech now. Like, like I was saying before, banks are in ad tech, buy now, pay later providers are in ad tech, media companies are in ad tech. Like, it has just become so widespread. Mm. Um, I know that social media is kind of painted as the bad guys, but Facebook might have come up with the model, but they certainly haven't got a monopoly um, on it. Um, and the, the problem is data. Like, the problem starts with the fact that we let businesses collect and store and use the data however they want. Um, and I think we can stop it at the source by putting really, really strict controls around the collection of data and the use of data. Um, and we have the opportunity right now 
in the next few months in Australia with the Privacy Act um, right. review. Um, so, you know, I think there are multiple ways to come at the problem. I think transparency is going to be an important part of the conversation. Um, but if you don't have the data to personalise, then you won't personalise. Um, and that reduces a lot of the incentive to do this kind of specific um, advertising. Mm. Man, that could be the subject of another panel. Um, yeah. <laughs> Amy, maybe I'll go to you for a, for a final kind of comment and then we'll... Yeah, uh, I echo everything that's just been said, so I'm not going to just um, <laughs> re-say it again. I think, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, transparency and it's important, but it's not all, all, all we need. It's not, that's not going to solve the problem. Um, it will help us really demonstrate the problem. Um, and the other thing around, um, and when we're talking about, you know, the, the data that's being collected um, through the observatory um, and sort of what we're talking about at the hackathon, some potential... Um, uh, mechanisms that might be sort of conceptualised is how how can we monitor what's going on because once well you know governments aren't going to you know create um, they're, they're not going to move on this if there's no way for them to be monitoring and holding companies accountable for whatever regulations they might putting in place. So it's important, it's kind of like goes in a circle, like it's important first for us to be able to show what's happening because that will help um, create some momentum here. But it's also really important then when we get the regulations in place to have systems to monitor what's going on because if we don't have systematic sort of monitoring of the advertising then it's really hard for us to hold companies accountable. Mm. So. Agreed. Um, I want to keep going, but we can't, can we, Mark? We've got to stop. So thank you to Amy and uh, Lucy, Kate and Erin for a great first panel. Uh, I think Mark will tell us where we're going next. Is that right? But thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>